This program was made possible by a grant from S.R. Foxley, Bob Generic, and Q, and by the generous support of viewers like you. If you wish to join them in pledging to this channel, please find a link to the Prophet of Zod Patreon below. <laughs> <laughs> huh, why is this weird tune stuck in my head? I mean, I don't usually hum things to myself, and when I do, it's when I'm just casually sitting around the house, not when I'm in a video only pretending to be casually sitting around the house. Uh. Oh, wait. Yeah, that's the Remedial Bible Lessons theme song, isn't it? Huh, it's been a little while since I've done one of those. Wait, it's been a big while since I've done one of those. Like, over two years. Oh, fuck. For goodness sake, we're all gonna take a Bible break. I said, praise the Lord, for goodness sake, we're all gonna take a Bible break. So when your fingers start to pop and your feet start to tap, you're listening to The Righteous Rap. So okay, I've been away from this for a super long time. For those of you who aren't familiar with Remedial Bible Lessons, they made up the first long-standing series on this channel, and they include some of my earliest and most embarrassing-looking videos. Basically, the idea was to compare modern Christian assumptions about the Bible with what's actually in the Bible, and I'd start with a question about Christianity before paraphrasing the answer people think is in the Bible and telling them it's wrong. Then I'd go on to discuss why. It was a fun series that a lot of people seem to find interesting, and I did have a soft spot for it as one of my earliest endeavors. But various things kept derailing the series for a while, and eventually it started to seem like the audience response was flagging a bit by comparison to my other videos. And while I noticed a lot of people were going back and binge-watching them, I just couldn't tell whether people felt that strongly about the series, so I just- Well, I do have some strong feelings about this, Sod. Well, hey look, it's Lee Lemon. In Pologia cartoon form, apparently. Is that okay? I can try to conjure up something else if this won't work. Hey, if you can stand me gesturing excessively and bobbing my head around when I talk, then I guess I can tolerate working with a cartoon character. I really loved your Bible lesson series because it touched on a lot of issues that I had growing up. Well, thanks. For those of you who don't know Lee, she's a longtime fixture of the atheist YouTube community, and I was flattered when she not only gave me a kick in the butt about getting back into these Bible lessons, but actually offered a co-host. If you somehow haven't heard of her, then make sure to find a link to her channel below and go subscribe. But before we kick things off, we'll let her explain what got her into the series and why she wanted to join it. You see, I grew up Pentecostal as well. In fact, I was so deep in my faith that my plan was to enter the ministry field. When I began studying my Bible, all I could think was, there must be something wrong with my understanding, because all of these things just look like glaring errors to me. But other people read it, and other people believe it, so, there must be something wrong with my understanding. Surely, everybody else can't be wrong, right? So, I searched. I searched online. I asked for guidance from priests and pastors and rabbis. Anybody who basically knew what they were doing, as far as, as I could understand. And, of course, I prayed. I prayed for the spirit of understanding. I fasted. I prayed and fasted. But yet, I came back to the same place, the same place that your Bible lessons come from. And so I'm so honored to be able to work on some of these with you. And I appreciate you joining me. Now today's topic is one I've really been looking forward to addressing, not only because all this wizardry sounds fun, but because it shows just how clearly the Bible undermines modern Christian ideas about how God and the supernatural work. When I was a Christian, I believed that God was all-powerful, and that every occurrence of the supernatural was a result of his direct, willful intervention or I guess maybe that of demonic spiritual forces sometimes. Was that generally the understanding you had, Lee? Yeah, basically. I remember everything was either done by God or because of Satan. Did you have nightmares last night? That was Satan. Beautiful, nice day today? 
that's from God. Now, I know it sounds pretty standard for most Christians to believe some things like this, but for anyone who isn't Pentecostal, they don't actually know how deep it goes. For example, I remember talking to another Christian who said that things must have been easier back in the day around Jesus' time since all this demonic activity and possession and stuff was happening back then. Basically, they were saying that it'd be easier to live back at a time when they could see for themselves that this is happening, as opposed to having to take it on faith because they read it in the Bible. I said, what do you mean? Of course this stuff still happens today. I genuinely believed that people were walking around possessed by Satan or filled with the Holy Spirit. It got to the point that when I needed help with my math homework, my mother made me stand up so we could pray away the so-called demon of confusion together. And no, it did not help me with my math homework. It didn't? (laughs) Wow, crazy. Having been a Pentecostal myself, I had the same sense that demons were everywhere and that praying to God would drive them away. And while most people aren't nearly that nuts about it, practically all of modern Christianity is rooted in the idea that supernatural manifestations, at least the good ones, flow directly and pretty much exclusively from God. But while that's the modern Christian idea of what happens, it would be interesting to see how things actually work in the Bible. Thus our question for today is, what brought about supernatural events in the Bible and how did they work? If you answer that the supernatural always comes about by acts of God and that they were always in accordance with his will or were possibly sometimes due to demonic forces, you'd actually be wrong. Oh, so you're answering the questions now. All right. The Old Testament contains many stories in which supernatural events are triggered by humans just speaking words and carrying out rituals or through the manipulation of objects that seem to have magical properties. And in many of these cases, it seems that it's the word, the ritual, or the magic object itself that conjures the miracle, independently of God, and often against his will. Very true. And in fact, the first example of this is seen in one of the very earliest Bible stories. As I explained in my very first Bible lesson, God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden because he was afraid they would gain immortality and become like gods if they ate from the tree of life. Now, there are two very striking things about this. First, The tree itself, not God, had the ability to grant immortality, and there was potential this could happen without God's knowledge if he wasn't looking. Second, it strongly implied that once humans ate the fruit, God would have been unable to reverse its effects. Or else why would he have been afraid of them eating it? That's a fantastic point. What really stuck out for me was the snake. When I read this story for myself the first time, I was shocked to find that the snake in Genesis 3 is just that. Just a serpent. It wasn't Satan in disguise like I learned in church, just a regular old serpent. In fact, right at the start of the chapter, Genesis 3, verse 1, the species is described as being the most crafty of all the wild beasts that God has created. And in this way, the serpent was able to orchestrate a situation completely out of God's control and totally against God's will. That always struck me as incredibly odd. How could the perfection of God's plan be undermined by a run-of-the-mill serpent? That's a great question, and it opens up all kinds of issues about the nature of God and the workings of biblical mythology and early scripture. I think one of the standouts for me would have to be the Ark of the Covenant. Basically, it was this fancy box built to contain things like the stone tablets on which one of the sets of the Ten Commandments was written, but also a pot of manna and some staff of Aaron. And the Ark had a lot of rules, like ways to carry it, how to store it, and even how to cover it. It was brought into battle on different occasions to ensure victory. But even though the Ark's a magic object, weren't most of its actions simply a manifestation of God's will? This one I remember very clearly. I remember being so upset about this in Sunday school. So one of these guys, Uzzah, he was trying to steady the Ark after his oxen stumble. And he's stricken dead immediately. So what, would God have preferred that the Ark fell to the ground? Would that have been better? Of course not. So why punish with death the person who did the ark, and by extension God, a favor in keeping it stable? It seemed like such a pointless death. It'd be one thing if Uzzah was looking into the ark out of curiosity, and thus in violation of the law. It'd be one thing if Uzzah was trying to steal the ark. And of course, while death is rather strict, at least it would have been levied upon him for having done an actual wrong. But in this case, he was trying to do something helpful, and he was killed anyway. Good point. Uzzah's intentions were good, and the effect of his actions were good. 
So while the passage technically says God struck him down in anger, his motivation for doing so is so implausible that it just sounds like he's being used to personify the magical consequences of touching the ark. This same reliance on magic objects, totally detached from the wishes of God, is dramatically shown in Exodus 17 when the staff of Moses was used to bring victory in a battle against the Amalekites. In this story, Moses went to the top of a hill and held up a staff as he looked down on the fighting. As long as he kept his arms up, holding the staff according to verse 9, Israel would win. But whenever his arms fell down, even due to fatigue, Israel would start losing. There are two really bizarre things about this. First, this story never says that God commanded Moses to hold up the staff or that he otherwise had anything to do with the story. And second, even if God were involved, I can't think of why he would possibly let his army lose just because Moses' arms got too tired to hold up a staff, or why he would suddenly intervene on their behalf the moment Moses and his aides devised a way to prop them back up. Seriously, why would his desire to help Israel win rest on something so silly? This story seems to be purely about an impersonal magical force that had to be conjured through proper use of a staff, evidenced even further by the fact that God's people never implored him for help instead focusing all their efforts on making sure the staff was held in such a way that its magical powers remained in effect. What makes this story even more confusing is the fact that God was so angry with the Israelites for idolatry. He wanted to be worshipped as God. It even says that he's a quote-unquote jealous God. And yet he gives them a tool that would be so easy to idolize. Or take Samson's hair, which gave him supernatural strength. Now, of course, it could be said that his strength came not from the hair, but as God's reward for honoring a vow never to cut it. But the story gives some pretty strong hints that Samson's strength depended less on God's will than on the simple physical length of his hair, or at least that the hair itself mattered to a pretty weird extent. According to Judges 16, he himself never cut his hair. Rather, Delilah and the Philistines cut it when he was asleep, meaning that he never really broke his vow. Yet despite that fact, and the fact that he had previously disgraced himself in far more spectacular fashion on many more occasions anyway, it was the severing of his hair that took his strength away. Now verse 20 does use the phrase, God had left him to indicate his strength was gone, but God's will still seems disconnected from the events of the narrative or anything a conscious intelligent deity would actually decide to do. And it remains bizarre the extent to which the power given to Samson was subject to the manipulation of a physical object rather than to the plans of God. You know, Judges 13 even starts off in a magical way. Samson's mother was barren and visited by an angel to inform her that her son would deliver the Israelites from the Philistines. It's really odd to me that God would rely on a human being to enact his plan. But the other strange thing was that Samson's mother was also told to go on a special diet or else Samson's power wouldn't exist. It's kind of similar to a type of spell, isn't it? To suggest that God's master plan could be totally shattered by a sip of wine a forkful of pork pull, or a cut of a barber. What always struck me as odd and unfair when I was a child was that God allowed Samson to have his power back one more time to destroy a building full of Philistines and himself. I was always taught that suicide was a direct route to hell, and yet here's God condoning this behavior. And that barely even scratches the surface of the messy and simply bizarre story about Samson, who could take up a whole Bible lesson on his own. One other thing I find interesting is how even God's power doesn't seem to be totally under his control. In my second lesson, I looked at how Exodus 33 portrays God as being unable to control a deadly energy that shot out of his face, and thus needing to shield Moses with his hand as he walked past. And not only is God unable to restrain his power, but the New Testament suggests that humans can steal it without his prior knowledge. The synoptic gospels all tell of how a woman tried to get healed by sneaking up behind Jesus and touching the hem of his robe. The interesting thing is that this strange plan worked, despite the fact that Jesus had never intended to heal her. It would seem that he was imbued with mystical energy that could be accessed against his will through physical contact with his clothing. And in fact, he had no idea this had taken place until he, quote, realized that the power had gone out of him. So we see once again, even in the New Testament, that supernatural power can be conjured by the manipulation of magical objects. You know, the pastor always focused on that part of the story where Jesus feels not the woman's touch, but that he felt his own power leave his body. That's how he noticed her. It wasn't like a tug on his robe. It was that his own power left him. And we were basically told that that's a sign of Jesus's 
ability or a sign of his divinity, a sign of his power, the fact that he can feel some of his power being taken. Now, at that time, I was really interested in the X-Men. I mean, as much as I could be, because it talked about the evils of evolution. And I remembered that Professor Xavier would be weak on his power, too. I mean, if he worked too much, for example, he was weakened. So was Jesus, like, some kind of superhero character and not God incarnate? I mean, certainly, as God incarnate, he'd be all-powerful, and that means that there would be no drain on his power. I mean, how could you subtract from infinity? But as striking as these examples are, there's a magic practice far more powerful than these objects, and that's the spells and curses uttered by people throughout the Old Testament. These spells are not prayers. They're not addressed to nor condoned by God, and they seem to operate independently from and apparently contrary to his will. Oh yeah, for sure. And one of the most brutal examples can be found in 2 Kings 2. This is the one about how a bunch of kids were making fun of Elisha for being bald. So in a hot-headed, totally disproportionate response, the prophet called down a curse that resulted in bears coming out and attacking them. Now setting aside the fact that this was totally brutal and unnecessary, God is never even described as being part of this situation. Instead, the attack of the bears is just described as directly following the utterance of the prophet's words. In church, we had it explained to us that to mock a prophet was basically to mock God, so the mauling of these children was totally justified. That never sat well with me. I mean, if someone attacks God today, as I was told was happening all the time with things like abortion being legal and LGBT persons not being murdered, God never struck them down. So how could he allow a prophet to sully his good name with murder? Well, if we assume God considers his name sullied when a murder takes place, which seems unlikely, maybe Moses and Joshua and David and so on had tallied so many homicides that it doesn't matter anymore. Who knows? But as long as we're talking about curses, we simply can't miss the one where Jacob tricked Isaac into giving him his blessing. Lee, would you like to bring us up to speed on this gem? Sure thing. Isaac has twin sons, Jacob and Esau. He really liked Esau and planned to give him his blessing, which was the birthright of the firstborn. And that was his plan to give it to him when he was near death. Jacob, on the other hand, was the preferred child of his mother, Rachel. When Isaac was nearing death, he told Esau to go hunting to prepare his favorite meal, and then he's going to give him his birthright blessing. While gone, Rachel instructs Jacob to pretend that he's Esau, and this works. Jacob receives the blessing. When Esau returns, he brings the meal to Isaac, and Isaac is confused and then upset that he was deceived by Jacob. Both men are very upset by Jacob. And there's more to the story, but the pertinent information here is that Isaac just can't revoke the birthright blessing. It appears to be some kind of magical spell that can only be granted once, and having received it, Jacob now completely possesses it. In Sunday school, there wasn't much talk about that part. It was more of a story about not lying to your parents because it could hurt people's feelings. And as an adult wanting to enter the ministry, of course this was difficult to read. Isaac was literally casting spells on his sons. What? And even forgetting... ...fucking stupid, would God seriously just watch this deception unfold, knowing full well that Isaac's blessing was intended for Esau? then proceed to bless Jacob for the rest of his life just because he's the one Isaac was unknowingly laying hands on as he spoke? The very idea is absurd. Thus, it's obvious that the authors of this story, insofar as they intended this to be taken literally at all, thought that humans had a magic ability to affect each other's lives by touching each other and uttering words, and that this power was entirely dependent not on God's will, but on the mechanics of a ritual, a ritual that was subject to manipulation or deception. Even worse, once this blessing was given to one person instead of another, it could not be retracted, meaning God himself was powerless to operate outside the terms of this spell. Or I guess maybe just didn't want to, I don't know. Thus he had no say in the fates of Jacob or Esau, or of the countless generations that followed. Rather, the course of their lives and the nation of Israel were determined by whatever words happened to escape the mouth of a blind elderly man almost certainly suffering from dementia. This simply doesn't make sense. Even as a child, or should I say especially as a child, hearing this was troublesome to me. Sure, we were told, this is why you don't lie to your parents, lying hurts people. But the story seemed both incredibly unfair and just didn't really make any sense. Just get mad at the trickster son, right? Remove the blessing and give it to the son that you want to bless. I mean, certainly this blessing is just a condoning or bestowing of things. 
A kind of verbal contract, right? It wasn't an actual magical spell, but according to the Bible, that's exactly what it appears to be. And of course, these stories bring up a host of questions, including, why do miracles and magic so often seem to be conjured independently of, and sometimes against, God's will? Why does God seem powerless to reverse any spells or curses once they take effect? Why does the supernatural seem to rely on the mechanics of location, objects, words, and ritual? Why do fundamentalist Christians hold to a concept of the supernatural that runs so totally contrary to what's found in most of the Bible? In short, why do passages of Scripture all seem to reflect the absurd, superstitious barbarism of whichever time they were written? Look, the Bible is obviously in conflict with Christianity's current notion of God. We live in a time in which some level of naturalistic and scientific thinking is pervasive even among many religious people. And generally speaking, Christians have a sense that the physical world operates according to consistent physical laws. So their idea of the supernatural has retreated all the way back to an ethereal plane inhabited by a single supernatural being. This being is, of course, the embodiment of all our highest ideals. All-powerful, ever-present, and perfectly good. And whenever he interacts in the physical universe, he does so with a conscious and intelligent purpose. And whatever happens is in line with his ultimate plan. But things were different in the ancient world. In an age of nearly complete scientific illiteracy, people lived in petrified awe of the world around them. Seeing magic as coming from everywhere, not just from God, and as happening for random reasons that had nothing to do with his will. Thus they thought that to protect themselves, or work the world to their advantage, they had to harness this magic. The Bible reflects this mindset to an extent that modern Christians should find embarrassing. And unless you really try to twist its words, The modern notion of an all-powerful God working miracles according to a perfect plan just isn't there. As thinking creatures, we have this ability to link up causes with their effects. Sometimes this goes awry, and that's how we end up with superstitions. We also have a tendency to embellish stories, especially to make them more interesting. But additionally, these stories may have never been intended to pass on religious ideas, but instead were simply to entertain around a campfire. I could easily see how Elisha's bear story might have started off with a real event, such as kids mocking a balding man, and he threw some stones at them and hit one child in the face, perhaps breaking his nose. Then the story may have grown from there. The child goes home with a bloodied face, and someone asks him what happened. It was Elisha, he'd say. Well, why'd he hurt you? The person would ask, and the child would respond, because I laughed at his baldness. Something like this could easily get passed around with gossip. Did you hear what Elisha did? Some child made fun of the fact that he's losing his hair, and Elisha attacked him. Then it would turn into Elisha using his powers as a prophet to harm the child. Then Elisha using his powers as a prophet of Yahweh to call upon the beasts of the land to devour the children as punishment. I could easily see how this would have been blown out of proportion. Unfortunately, that's how a lot of the Bible reads. As Zod said, Much of what we see in the Bible isn't in line with modern Christianity and its view of God as an all-powerful and all-knowing being. What would it mean for these tales to simply be campfire exaggerations? Thank you for watching this remedial Bible lesson with Prophet of Zod and Lee Lemon. Please join us next time as we discuss ooey, gooey, sticky, slimy, but also pleasing blood sacrifices. And as always, if you have suggestions for future topics, please let us know in the comments below. I learned my lesson, now I take time out each day for Bible break. Because the Bible is the holy book. Let's open it up and take a look. I've learned my lessons, cause I take